Bible teachers around the world are talking about the modern nation of Israel, about a rebuilt Jewish temple in Jerusalem, and a final Mideast battle called Armageddon. Best-selling author Hal Lindsey, in his book, The Late Great Planet Earth, said, what is happening right now to Israel is significant in the entire prophetic picture. Are these popular teachings really biblical? Discover shocking answers to these questions and more in this eye-opening seminar, Israel in Prophecy. It's hot, it's controversial, it's explosive. We're gonna do our best to study this topic right from the Bible, from God's good book. I invite you to open up the Holy Scriptures to the book of Proverbs chapter two. Proverbs chapter two, this is the beginning of a six part series where we're gonna be studying some of the most powerful and, and interesting subjects that we can study related to Bible prophecy. Proverbs chapter two, verse six, I've decided to pick this as, a, as an opening text, as sort of a guiding light to help us to realize our need for wisdom that comes down from above that is greater than human wisdom. I invite you to bow your heads. Let's begin with prayer. We really need to pray and, and look to our Heavenly Father to teach us as we get into the good book. Let's pray. Dear Father, Holy Father in Heaven, thank you so much for, for every person that has come out here to study this subject, and we pray right now in the name of Jesus. We pray for the leading of the Holy Spirit and for wisdom as we open your book and try to unravel the mysteries of Bible prophecy. In the name of Jesus we ask, Amen. Okay, let's take a look. Proverbs chapter 2, the sixth verse. The Bible says, For the Lord gives, and what's that next word? Wisdom. wisdom, that's right. The Lord gives wisdom, and out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. So this verse tells us that God is the one who gives wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, and we need a whole lot of that today, don't we? especially as we get into this very, very difficult and controversial subject. It is a fact that right now there are millions of Christians around this world who are extremely interested in the whole subject of Bible prophecy. Now, why are they so interested? I think the reason is because Christians from all denominations, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Adventist, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Assembly of God, different denominations all over this country, Christians are sensing as they look around the country and see all of these, you know, terrible things that are happening. They see the natural disasters and the moral slide that our country is in the midst of. And people are just sensing more and more that we are getting closer and closer to the coming of the Lord. There's a whole lot of people. I've been holding Bible prophecy seminars for about six years. I've been to Russia. I've been to Canada. I've been to New Zealand. I've been crisscrossing the country, holding prophecy seminars on the book of Revelation. And I have just, I've met so many Christians who just sense, they tell me over and over again, Steve, we know it. We feel it. Something is coming. And we want to understand more about Bible prophecy. Now, what, what is happening right now is as Christians are trying to understand the mysteries of God's Word and trying to understand what is going to happen in the days ahead, they are turning on the radio, they're going into bookstores, they're picking up books on Bible prophecy, and they are more and more being directed to the Middle East, to the Middle East, to Israel, to the nation of Israel, to Jerusalem, to the Jewish people. And this is something that is, that is a, a worldwide phenomenon. And what we're going to do in this seminar is we're going to study these whole issues of Israel. You can see behind me, I love this beautiful set that has been designed for us for this special seminar dealing with the city of Jerusalem. And what's happening is people are looking over there, aren't they? They're looking to the Middle East more and more to try to understand what is supposed to happen. It is no secret that the majority of Bible prophecy teachers who write books, who, who are on television, who speak on the radio about prophetic subjects, it's no secret that they have come to believe that the nation of Israel is definitely and will be at the center of the swirl of end time events. Now, it's easy to prove this, and let me just illustrate this for you with a couple of current illustrations. This is a magazine that came out not too long ago. This is a front cover issue of Newsweek, and the whole issue is on Bible prophecy. This is November 1, 1999, not too long ago, and this is what it says, prophecy, what the Bible says about the end of the world. And the feature article is dealing with current prophetic views, what 
Christians are teaching, what is happening around the country, and what, what Bible prophecy scholars are actually expressing as to what is supposed to happen in the end times. Now, let me read a couple of sentences to you that are, I think, very, very significant. On page 73 here, here's a statement. This is from Newsweek, November 1, 1999, page 73. It says, the predominant emphasis in Christian prophecy is on the return of the Jews to the Holy Land and the rebuilding of the Jerusalem temple. That's the predominant emphasis in Christian theology. Now, here's another statement from the same magazine. This is on page 71. It says, for true believers, ground zero for apocalyptic zealotry remains the city of Jerusalem. Now, the whole context of this, this magazine or this article, this feature article, had to do with the whole Y2K scare. I'm sure you're aware of what happened. You know, people were saying around the country and around the world that possibly when the, when the computer, when the clock clicked over to the year 2000, there was going to be disasters. Uh, banks were going to fail. Planes were going to crash. Nuclear missiles were going to go off. And it was going to result in economic terror. And along with this, there was an increasing interest in prophecy, thinking that maybe this is going to be the beginning of the Battle of Armageddon. And as a result of this, a lot of people were looking toward Jerusalem. And people were thinking, if the end of the world is coming, if Y2K is the beginning of the end, they were saying, Jerusalem is the place to watch. Let's focus on Israel and focus on the Middle East. Now, here's also a series of books that I'd just like to show you that also illustrate that this is a dominant teaching in the Christian world. If you go into just about any Christian bookstore, and if you look up under the section of Bible prophecy, you can find books like this. This is one of Hal Lindsey's best-selling books, and it's called Planet Earth 2000 AD. Uh, Hal Lindsey is a best-selling Christian author, and in this book, chapter 8 is called Israel, Center of World Destiny. And that's just one example. Here's another one. Here's another book written by a man by the name of Ed Dobson, a Bible scholar. And he says here on the front cover, it says also why Jesus could return by A.D. 2000. Fifty remarkable events that point to the end. And one of the chapters in this book, chapter 3, is called, and there you see it right on the screen, Israel is God's focus for the future. And this book gives all the reasons for this, this conclusion. Here's another book, and this was written by a man by the name of Randall Ross, also a Christian Bible scholar, and this book is called The Next Seven Great Events of the Future. And chapter two of this book is called Recognition of Israel as the Forgotten Key to End Time Prophecy. So there's another illustration, and here's one more I'll show you. This is a book written by Peter and Patty Lalande, very well-known Bible prophecy commentators. They used to have a national television program. I don't know if they still do. Haven't really been keeping up to date with them to the moment. But this book is called The Edge of Time, The Final Countdown Has Begun. And it's all about Bible prophecy and the end of the world. And one of these chapters... See it on the screen there? Chapter 3 is called The Third Temple, dealing with the rebuilding of the temple on the Temple Mount. Chapter 2 is called The Promised Land and the Holy City, dealing with Jerusalem. And chapter 13 is called The Aligning of the Nations Against Israel. How many of you have heard of or have seen the popular movie called The Omega Code? Do I see any, any hands out there? Anybody have seen this movie? Okay, I see quite a few hands. Uh, the Omega Code came out not long ago. And this was actually a premier Christian film produced by Christians. It, it worked its way right into the, into the national media. And the whole focus of the film was Bible prophecy. And from what I read somewhere, it grossed over $2 million its opening weekend. And the whole focus of the film was end time events. And it opened. The opening scene was, guess what city? Who knows? It was Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem in Israel. And, and the movie swirled around eventually that holy city as you continue on watching this program. And so we find Newsweek magazine talking about Bible prophecy and Israel. We find books in Christian bookstores focusing, and there are, there are many, many, many books that talk about the same thing, Israel in Bible prophecy. 
There are movies like The Omega Code, and there are other movies that have been produced also by Christians that talk about the same thing. If you turn on the radio, many times when you focus on Christian stations, you will hear Bible prophecy teachers talking about Israel and prophecy. It's on television, it's in magazines, it's on the internet. If you're on the internet and you type in Bible prophecy on some search engine like Yahoo or somewhere, and you'll go around the net and you'll find all kinds of different websites that all talk about Israel, the Middle East, Jerusalem, the Jews, and a Middle East battle of Armageddon. There are also seminaries that teach this, Christian seminaries, and, and recently, in the last few years, especially, even more recently, as we get just the other day, I saw one as I was driving down the highway, there are Bible prophecy seminars being, being advertised on different uh, billboards and in magazines and various places where Christians come together in different parts of the country and discuss this whole issue of Bible prophecy. And inevitably, almost always, the focus eventually turns toward the Middle East and toward the nation of Israel. Now, as you become aware of this, as I think probably just about all of you are, this phenomenon that is happening in the Christian world right now as people are getting sensing we're getting closer to the end, and as you start studying prophecy and studying these different different schools of thought and different opinions about the end times, it's obvious that not everybody agrees on every point. You know, one author might say one thing, another author, author might say something else, and there are differences of opinion. But what has happened is there, there is a basic set of core beliefs that have, have arisen up out of the Christian world that really summarize the essence of what is almost universally taught when it comes to the conservative Christian community when they think about Bible prophecy. And let me just uh, summarize for you briefly what is the main outline, the main scenario, regardless of the various minor differences of opinion of what most people believe when they think about prophecy. Number one, people believe, generally speaking, that there will be at some point in the future an event called the rapture. And during the rapture, the Christians around the world will vanish and will be taken up to meet Jesus in the sky. They will disappear, and a lot of other people will wake up. You know, a husband will, will reach over to kiss his wife in the morning, and she might be gone because she was a Christian and he wasn't. Uh, some plane might crash. Some football player, you know, might go back for a pass, and he gets sacked. But if he's a Christian... Maybe at the rapture, when the people get, when the other men get off of him, lo and behold, the guy's gone. And there are movies that talk about this. There's a very popular movie called A Thief in the Night that illustrates this. And so this event, the rapture, will be the, really the beginning of the end, according to common understanding. And when the rapture takes place, the Christians are gone, and that will be the beginning of what is often referred to as a seven-year period of tribulation. That's the next event. This is what these books teach seven years of tribulation. During the seven years of tribulation, God's focus will be on Israel. The church will be gone, and Israel will be the center of his, of his end time timetable. During that time, or somewhere around there, the Jewish temple will be rebuilt on the Temple Mount in the Middle East, in the heart of Jerusalem. Sometime during this period, a man will arise up, a mysterious man. You can see his uh, the illustration of him on the screen, this movie, The Omega Code, this man is going to be called the Antichrist, and The Omega Code depicted this individual rising up during the seven years of tribulation. He's a mysterious man, a very powerful man, the Antichrist, who would rise out of Europe, and eventually he would work his way over into, into Israel, and he would at some point enter the rebuilt Jewish temple, and he would then sit down and claim that he is God. This is the next event in the common understanding of end-time events. And supposedly, during this time, when he does this, the Jewish people, by and large, will reject him because they don't believe this man is God. And what will happen next is that this, this rejection of the Antichrist by the Jewish people will spark a final war. The Antichrist will marshal the forces of the world and Russia will be involved, the Chinese will be involved, and all the nations of the world will sweep down into a valley north of Jerusalem called the Valley of Megiddo, and there will be a final Middle East war called the Battle of Armageddon. And right at the conclusion of that battle, Jesus will then return, conquer the Antichrist, conquer the Russians and the Chinese, deliver Israel, and set up his kingdom, and then he will rule through he will rule in Jerusalem for a thousand years, 
the millennial kingdom, the kingdom of peace. Now, these seven points, this is what is basically and almost universally believed by very earnest, sincere Bible prophecy teachers today. We have the rapture, we have the seven years, we have God's focus on Israel, we have the rebuilding of the temple, we have the Antichrist going into the temple, we have the Jews rejecting him, we have the Antichrist gathering the nations to fight against Israel, we have the Middle East Battle of Armageddon, and then we have the coming of Jesus to conquer the Antichrist, deliver Israel, open their eyes that he's the Messiah, and then to rule on earth from Jerusalem for a thousand years. How many of you are aware of this, this basic scenario? Let me just see some hands. Okay, just about all of you. And I want to say this is very, very sincerely and honestly and earnestly taught, and it is also taught by using the Bible, by using God's book. Now, the purpose of this seminar, this six-part series, series, and this is just part number one, is to examine these very, very popular and yet controversial teachings and to examine them also right from the Bible itself, from God's Word. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through these points, point by point, and we're going to try to discern whether these teachings really are according to the good book. Does that sound like a good plan? for us to take a very, very close and careful look. Let me just give you a brief overview of what we're going to do in the next, the next uh, six meetings. Counting tonight, we've got five more after this. Tonight is really just an overview of this whole subject. As we'll get in farther, we'll look at the core issues that are involved in this whole subject. In our next meeting, we're going to talk about the word Israel itself. What does the word Israel mean anyway? Where did the word come from? It actually originated in Genesis 32 when a holy angel spoke from heaven and changed Jacob's name to Israel. And we'll study about this and talk about what, where the name came from, why the name was given, what the name really means, and what are the, the deep lessons that we can learn from that name. Part three, we're going to talk about Israel and Jesus Christ. Israel in the Old Testament, Israel in the New Testament, and how this ties in with the Messiah, with Jesus. Part four, we're going to talk about the seven years of tribulation. We're going to unravel this topic and study especially Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, which is the main passage that is used to teach a seven-year period of tribulation. Part five, we're going to talk about the temple. I've decided to call this Titanic Truths About the Temple. We're going to really dig in and study all about this. Uh, you can see over here on my right this golden dome illustrating the Dome of the Rock over in Israel. Some people believe that this Dome of the Rock is going to be blown up in order to make room for the rebuilding of a Jewish temple. And we're going to talk about this whole subject on night five. And then part six, we're going to go completely into the book of Revelation. We're going to talk about what the book of Revelation teaches about Israel, about Jerusalem, about Babylon, and ultimately about the great battle, the Battle of Armageddon. So that will be our sixth part, focusing on the book of Revelation. Now, what I'd like to do now is have you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and what we're going to do right now is we're going to lay a foundation, a deep, solid foundation for this whole subject. Foundations are very, very important. Uh, most of us live in Texas. This seminar is being broadcast from Texas. At least that's where it's being produced. That's where we are. And uh, those of you who have been involved in buying a house in Texas, you're aware of the fact that the soil moves a lot in this state. Isn't that true? And if you get in the wrong house, and if the soil's been moving too much, you know, the water comes down, there's a lot of clay, and the soil comes up, or the soil goes down if there's not enough water, and then what happens is the, the house begins to move, the foundation begins to move, and the foundation starts cracking, your walls can start cracking, and your whole house can come down, just about. And foundations are very, very important. And the same is true with our study of the Bible. Foundations. The Scripture says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? So we need to study the foundations of truth, and that's what I hope to do in this first part, is to look at a very important foundational issue, and that issue has to do with the issue of spiritual discernment. Spiritual discernment. This is just vital as we get into our subject. So let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 
And let's look at verse 14 and verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 and verse 15. These are the words of the Apostle Paul. Paul wrote, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them, because they are, and what is, then what does it say? Spiritually what? Spiritually discerned. Right, spiritually discerned. Now here it talks about a natural person who only sees things on the surface. He doesn't spiritually understand the things that come from the Holy Spirit. Now then the next verse goes on, and Paul says, but he that is spiritual judges all things. So, here we have a natural person and a spiritual person. Natural people just don't under th understand the things of the Spirit. But a spiritual person can discern things that come from God. Are you with me? That's what this passage is telling us. Now, let's go back to the book of John, and let's do a little survey here. A survey of the Gospel of John. John wrote five books in the New Testament. John wrote, obviously, the book of John. He wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And then what was, the, what was the fifth book that John wrote? That's right. John wrote the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, the great book on Bible prophecy that brings all the other prophecies together into one grand mosaic, one powerful book. Now, in the book of Revelation, John wrote, he wrote about Israel. He wrote about Babylon. He wrote about the final battle of Armageddon. And John also wrote the book of John. And as we go through this book, we're going to discover some amazing issues that deal with spiritual discernment. Let's start with John chapter 2. And let's just walk our way through. Let's let our fingers do some walking. As they say, let your fingers do the walking. And let's, take, let's just walk a little bit. John chapter 2. Let's take a look at the 18th verse. John chapter 2, verse 18. The Bible says that Jesus answered and said to them, he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, forty and six years was this temple in building and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Jesus said, if you destroy this temple, I'll build it in three days. Now, those particular people that Jesus was talking to, they were, they were natural people. They only saw things on the surface. And when they heard Jesus say, destroy this temple, what did they think? They thought about the literal temple that was there in Jerusalem. And they said, it took 46 years to build this temple. How can you destroy it and build it in only three days? Now, notice the next verse in verse 21. The Bible says, but he spoke of the temple of his what? Of his body. That's right. Jesus was using the temple as an illustration of his own body. And so what he was doing really in this passage was he was talking about a spiritual temple. But those particular people, they only saw on the surface and they thought he was talking about the literal temple. But he wasn't. He was talking about a spiritual temple in this passage. Okay, let's go on to John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and verse... John 3 and verse 3, Jesus is talking to a Jewish man named Nicodemus. And Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, Nicodemus, even though you're, you're a religious leader, he said, you've got to be born again. Now notice verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, he said, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, Nicodemus, at this point, even though he was a religious man, was really a natural man. And Nicodemus, all he saw was on the surface. And when Jesus said, You've got to be born again, what did he think? He thought, How can a man go back into his mother's womb and be born a second time. He didn't realize that Jesus was talking about a spiritual birth. If you go down and look at verse 6, Jesus said, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So here Jesus was talking about a spiritual birth that is the result of the Holy Spirit. 
Are you with me? Not a literal birth back through, back through his mother's womb. That's not what he was talking about. Okay, let's go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, Jesus is talking to a woman at a well. And in verse 10, Jesus first asked her for a drink. Or I'm, yeah, Jesus asked her for a drink, and then they began a conversation, and then Jesus answered and said to this woman, he said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me to drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. So Jesus is here offering this woman living water. And then in verse 11, the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and this well is deep. From where, then, have you this living water? Now, this woman, just like Nicodemus, was a natural woman, wasn't she? And when Jesus talked about giving her living water, what did she think? She said, this is a deep well. How are you going to get down there and get living water? And she only saw on the surface. But Jesus was not talking about literal water, was he? He was talking about the water of life, spiritual water, but she missed it. It went whew, right over her head because she wasn't seeing spiritual things at this moment. Now, let's go to chapter 6. John chapter 6. Okay, John chapter 6, verse 54. Jesus said, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So Jesus said, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, what was Jesus talking about? Was he talking about, you know, him holding out his arm and having people put a little salt and pepper on there and take a big bite? <laughs> Obviously not. When you go back to verse, I think it's verse 52, notice what's happening here. In verse 52, the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now, these people were just natural people, weren't they? When Jesus said, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, they only saw on the surface of things. They didn't realize. They didn't have spiritual discernment. And they didn't realize that he wasn't talking about eating his actual body. Obviously not. But they didn't see that. And so they argued and they said, how can he do this? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? But in verse 63, Jesus clarifies and he says, it is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And when Jesus was talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, he was talking about his spiritual body, which is also in the word. The Bible says the word was made flesh and we take in the word and when we read the word of God and take it in and digest it, we are receiving the words of the Lord. We are receiving the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ through receiving his word into our lives. That's what he was talking about. So here we have in the book of John, chapter 2, Jesus talks about a spiritual temple, but the people there, they missed it, and they thought he was talking about a literal temple. In John chapter 3, he was talking about a spiritual birth, but Nicodemus missed it, and he thought he was talking about a natural birth. In John chapter 4, we have Jesus talking about living water, but the woman only saw on the surface, and she missed it, and she thought he was talking about literal water, but it was the water of life. In John chapter 6, we find Jesus talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and the people that were there, they missed it, and they went right over their heads, and they thought he was talking about actual cannibalism. And that was one of the reasons why they rejected him. When you read on in John chapter 6, it says many of the disciples walked away from him after that, and they walked no more with him, and they didn't realize that he was talking about, about a spiritual body. So we see John 2, John 3, John 4, John 6. Over and over again, Jesus Christ used literal things to illustrate spiritual truths. Do you see that? It's right there in the Bible. Now, John, who wrote John 2, 3, 4, and 6, also wrote the book of Revelation. Revelation starts out... In Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the first line says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus revealed the book of Revelation to John. And when you read the book of Revelation, it talks about Babylon. It talks about Israel. It talks about a great battle called the Battle of Armageddon. Now let me ask you, do you think we need spiritual discernment from the Holy Spirit to understand what Revelation is talking about when it talks about Israel, Babylon, and Armageddon. 
Definitely we do. And we're going to be studying a lot more about this when we get to our last part of this, this series on Israel and prophecy. <clears throat> we'll focus all on the book of Revelation. Okay, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Chapter 10. And I also want to tell you how thankful I am that you're here. I really enjoy studying the Bible with a group of people. This is very, very exciting to me. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, 1 Corinthians, we already read chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, where Paul talked about the importance of being spiritual and discerning spiritual things, right? Now, here we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and if you look at the 18th verse, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 18, notice here what Paul says. We'll just look at the first part, the first part of this verse. And I put it on the screen so you can't miss it. Verse 18, Paul says, Behold, take a look. And what does he tell us to behold? What's that next word? Israel. Behold Israel. Take a look at Israel, Paul says. And, but then notice he clarifies, and he says, Behold Israel after the what? After the flesh. There is, according to the New Testament, an Israel after the flesh. And Paul draws lessons from Israel after the flesh in this passage. We're not going to look at the lesson right now, but, but my point is that there is an Israel according to the flesh. Now, the Israel of the flesh is an Israel that is composed of people who as of yet, we hope this will change, but as of yet, these people do not believe in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Messiah. Now, there are Jewish people that do believe in Jesus. I am a Jewish person, and I believe in Jesus. I accepted him as my Messiah just about 20 years ago. So there are Jewish people that believe in Jesus, and there are Jewish people that haven't quite yet come to, to discover Jesus as their Messiah. And here, when Paul talks about Israel after the flesh, he's talking about Israel composed of people who do not as yet believe in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to prove to you in just a few moments that just like there is an Israel, there is an Israel after the flesh, so there is another Israel, an Israel that is in the Spirit, an Israel that is composed of Jews and Gentiles who believe in Jesus Christ. I'm going to prove that right from the Bible in just a few moments. Let's go to the book of Romans. Romans, this is very, very exciting. Very exciting, hot, thrilling, controversial, yes, but important for us to know. Romans chapter 8. Now let's take a look at verse 5. Romans 8, verse 5. Paul is writing here, and Paul says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now here, just like in Corinthians, Paul talks about two different kinds of people. There's the natural man, and then there's the spiritual man. There's the person that doesn't have the Holy Spirit and who only sees on the surface of things, and then there's a person who has the Spirit of God in his life and is therefore able to discern spiritual things. See that? And Paul, in actually the first half of Romans 8, talks about these two groups. And it's very important that we are people in the Spirit, not in the flesh. Isn't that right? We want to be Christians, believers, who have the Spirit of God and who are not walking in the flesh. And this is what this whole section is about. Okay, now let's go to chapter 9 and let's focus on the subject of Israel. In Romans 9, which builds on Romans 8, Romans chapter 9, verse 1, this is what Paul wrote. He said, I say the truth in Christ. Paul said, I'm telling you the truth. Now, some people stumble, or at least most people stumble over truth at least, at least once in their life. But most of the time, they get up and they go on. But we don't want to just stumble over the truth. We want to hold on to the truth. Amen? We want to know it and hold it. Paul said, I say the truth that is in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also is bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. 
for I could wish that I myself were, were even cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now here Paul is expressing the burden of his heart. He's expressing his sorrow and his sadness because he had friends, he had, he had Jewish brothers and sisters that he loved, that he cared for, that at the point of his writing didn't know the love of their own Messiah, didn't know the love of Jesus, and Paul was burdened about this. And he even wished that he was, he's even saying here that he could even wish that he was lost rather than have them be lost. Now notice, at the end of verse 3, he talks about my kinsmen according to the flesh who are Israelites. Okay, do you see that? Now this verse, once again, just like in 1 Corinthians 10, 18, where Paul said, Behold, Israel after the flesh, in this verse, he said, he's talking about his kinsmen according to the flesh who are Israelites. So it's very clear, isn't it, that there is an Israel according to the flesh. Now verse Verse 6. Verse 6 is one of the most important passages that we can read. In fact, I have a whole book that deals with the subject of Israel in Bible prophecy that we'll make available during this seminar. And this book deals with this whole topic. And this, this verse, Romans chapter 9, verse 6, is a key foundation passage for my whole book. You ever been in a dark room where you can't see anything? And then, and then someone opens a, do a door and a light comes in, and when that beam of light comes in, all of a sudden you can see things that you, you weren't able to see before. You know what that's like? When light comes into a dark room, you can see things you've, you've, you, you weren't able to see before. And it's the same with this passage. This passage is like a beam that shines into the darkness of this world. And in the light of this text, we're going to be able to see some things that maybe we've never seen before. Romans 9, verse 6, Paul says, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all, and what's that word? They are not all Israel, he says, which are of, and what's that next word? Israel. The word is Israel. Now, how many times in your Bible is the word Israel used in verse 6? How many times? Two times. Do all your Bibles have the word Israel twice? Now, if you look carefully at that passage, what Paul is doing is he is telling us, folks, he's telling us, he's shining light that there are actually two Israels. In my book, I have a chapter called The Shocking Principle of Two Israels. And this is amazing. And what Paul is saying here, when you, when you analyze it carefully, he's saying they are not all Israel, meaning God's Israel, who are of Israel, which is of the natural Jewish nation. I'll say it again. Paul is saying they are not all Israel, meaning God's Israel, and I'll show you a verse before this meeting is over, that there is an Israel of God. And Paul says, They are not all Israel, the Israel of God, which are of Israel, referring to the literal Jewish nation, the Israel of the flesh. Did you catch that? Two Israels. And they're not all God's Israel, that are of the nation of Israel. That's a very, very important concept. And let me just put this on the screen here. There is an Israel of the flesh, as we have already discovered, and there is also an Israel, an Israel of God. And I'll prove to you in just a few moments that the Israel of God is composed of Jews and non-Jews or Gentiles who believe in Jesus Christ. I'll prove that to you right from the Bible. Now go down to verse 8. Verse 8 is also another one of those foundation pillar texts. And if we're going to build a house of understanding in the, in the end times that we're living in, folks, we've got to lay a solid biblical foundation. If our foundation has cracks in it, our whole house can come crashing down. Jesus said in Matthew 7, he said, a wise man builds his house where? Upon a rock. And when the rain comes down and the, and the winds, you know, beat against the house and the the floods rise. Jesus said that house is going to stand because it's built upon the rock. But then he said a foolish man builds his house upon the sand. 
And then when the rain comes down, the floods come up, and the wind beats against that house, Jesus said that house is going to come crashing down. And so it's very important that we build on the rock of truth. Are you with me? It's extremely important, especially when it comes to prophecy. So, verse 8 is another foundation text. Romans 9, verse 8. Paul continues, and this is what he says. He says, that is, he's clarifying now about these two Israels. He says, that is, they which are the children of the flesh. Paul said, and this is referring to the children of the flesh, natural descendants of Abraham, the Israel of the flesh. Paul says here, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Now, Paul's very clear on this, and this is a very powerful and rather pointed passage, but it's, it's biblical. And this is what Paul says, they which are the children of the flesh. Now, God loves the children of the flesh, doesn't he? God loves everybody. God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. God loves Jewish people. God loves non-Jewish people. God loves everybody. Jesus loves everybody. But when it, when it comes to, to spirituality, being spiritual children of God, this is, Paul's very clear. They which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise. They are counted for the seed. Wow. Now, this text is full of light, and I want to examine this. The children of the promise, they are counted for the seed. God made promises to the seed of Abraham, the seed of Isaac, the seed of Jacob, which is Israel. Isaiah 41, verse 8 says Israel is the seed of Abraham. And God made lots of promises to the seed of Abraham. Now, Paul says here that the children of the promise, they are counted as the seed. Now, what does he mean, the children of the promise? What is he talking about, the promise? What is the promise? Let's turn to Galatians, Galatians chapter 3. And Paul tells us very, very plainly what that promise is and what it means to be a child of the promise. Galatians chapter 3. Now, the book of Galatians was written predominantly to Gentiles, to those who are not Jews. And in Galatians 3, verse 14, this is what Paul wrote. Here's another hot text. Paul said that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, through the Messiah, that we might receive, and what's that next, those next two words? The promise. Now, what is the promise? Paul says that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Hallelujah. This is a deep text. And Paul is talking about believers through faith, Gentiles and Jews who believe in Jesus and the Messiah. That's where faith comes in. Paul says those who have this faith, they will receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now, how does a person get born again? Jesus said it's through the Spirit. How do we have spiritual discernment? It's through the Spirit. What is the only the only power that can get us out of living life in the flesh. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul said the children of the flesh are not God's children. But he said those of the promise, they are counted as the seed. And what he's saying is that if we, if we believe in Jesus and have faith in him and receive the promise of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and through that power, through that Holy Spirit, we're born again. In other words, we start, we start seeing new things. Our hearts start changing. Our lives are changing. Our characters are being transformed into the image of Jesus. And we start seeing spiritual things with new eyes. We have the, the power of the Spirit, which we receive through faith. And Paul says, those who have that, Paul says, they are counted as the seed. Now go to chapter 3, verse 29. Galatians 3, verse 29. This is another one of those 
foundation texts. Galatians chapter 3, take a look at verse 29. This is a very, very, this is a wonderful passage, and this ought to give us all great encouragement. Galatians 3, verse 29, Paul says, and, and if you, now who's he writing to here? He's writing to Gentiles. He's writing to you, isn't he? And Paul says, and if you be Christ's, if you belong to Jesus, what does he say? He says, then are you, and who are you? Who are you, folks? Say it again. Who are you, folks? Right. That's right. Praise the Lord. God says, you are Abraham's seed. In other words, if you believe in Jesus, if you belong to Christ, if you receive the promise of the Spirit, God counts you as the seed. Now, who is Abraham's seed anyway? Isaiah 41, verse 8 says, Israel is the seed of Abraham. That is Abraham's seed. And then Paul goes on in verse 29, and he says, and you are an heir. Now, what is an heir? An heir is someone who is entitled to inherit something else. Do we have any, uh, any heirs here? <laughs> Anybody who's ever received a big inheritance? Oh, I see a hand. <laughs> Wonderful. Let's talk after the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Not a big one. <laughs> An heir is someone who is entitled to receive something. Now, in the Bible, God, all throughout the Old Testament, which we call the Hebrew Scriptures, God has made promises to Abraham and to his seed. Lots and lots of promises. Now, the question is, who is the heir to those promises? Who is entitled to receive those promises? Paul says in Galatians 3.29, he says to Gentiles, if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed, and you are an heir, an heir according to the promise. In other words, you are entitled to inherit all of these blessings, all of these promises that God gave to his people. I hear a child there saying amen. God loves us all, and he's given us precious promises in this book, and he wants us to be an heir of those promises. Okay, now let's go to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, and let's take a look at verse 14 through 16. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. And this is where it all comes together. In verse 14, Paul says, but God forbid, God forbid that I should glory, that any human being should, should glory in himself, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus loves us all, and he died on the cross for all of our sins. And Paul says, he said, this is what I want to glory in. It's, it's Calvary. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Paul says, I'm dead to the world. The world doesn't have an influence over me anymore because I now, I see the cross of Christ. I see the love of Christ. I see what my Messiah has suffered and what he's been through. Now notice verse 15. Paul says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision avails anything, that's circumcision on the side of Jewish people, nor uncircumcision, that's on the side of Gentile people. Paul says, really, the issue is not circumcision or uncircumcision, and then he says, but a new creature or a new creation. This is really where it's at. Paul said, it's not circumcision or uncircumcision, it's a person being made new through the cross. That's what it's all about, being a new person, receiving the power of the Spirit, being born again, getting out of the flesh, and living in the Spirit. This is what it's all about. Now, notice verse 16. Verse 16 says, And as many as walk according to this rule, this rule, this standard, this doctrine, Paul says, peace be upon them and mercy 
and upon, and then notice the last four words, peace be upon them and mercy, and upon who else? He says, upon the Israel of God. Do you see that? Now, who is the Israel of God? Who is God's Israel? God's Israel is an Israel that is centered in Jesus Christ. God's Israel is an Israel composed of Jews, like me, and Gentiles, most of which are you. But really, it's not circumcision or uncircumcision. You know, that really doesn't make any difference anymore. The Israel of God is composed of Jews and Gentiles together who believe in Jesus Christ, who are centered in Jesus Christ, who receive the promise of the Spirit, and they are therefore counted, according to the Bible, they are counted as the seed. Are you with me? They are God's seed. Therefore, they are God's Israel, the Israel of God. Is this clear so far? Am I talking according to the Bible? Or am I, am I way off somewhere out in left field? Am I biblical? Am I sticking to the book? To the good book? Okay, let me just summarize. There is an Israel of the flesh composed of natural descendants of Abraham, and there is an Israel of God that knows God, that is in God, that believes and is centered in Jesus Christ and who has the Holy Spirit. Jews and Gentiles both are counted as that seed. I grew up in the Hollywood Hills in Southern California. I was born in 1959. You can date me now. And I grew up in a, in a wonderful Jewish home. And I love my, my parents, I love my family. But as I look back, as I grew up, I, I did not know, I didn't know God for the first 20 years of my life. I never read this book in my life for the first 20 years. I never cracked a Bible. My brother was bar mitzvahed. He had an interest in, uh, in going to the synagogue, but there was no interest for me. I remember a few Passovers. I remember Hanukkahs. I remember uh, various things that we used to do as Jewish people. But honestly, this book I never read. I did not know God at all. Didn't even know anything about Jesus, that there even was hardly a Jesus. And for the first 20 years of my life, I was... I was part of Israel, but which Israel was I a part of? I was part of Israel of the flesh. That's right. I was just a flesh, flesh person. Um, when I got into my teen years, I took a dive as a result of peer pressure and friends, and I pretty much went off the deep end and started using marijuana and drinking alcohol heavily and using other kinds of drugs, and it's a miracle that I'm still alive right now. It's a miracle that I can be right here today opening this book to you. My sister once told my father that if Steve hadn't become a Christian, he'd be dead. And I really believe that that's, that's true. I was part of the Israel of the flesh. And then when I was 20 years old, through a whole set of circumstances, and I'm not going to go into all the details right now, God opened my eyes and he showed me that Jesus Christ was Jewish and that Jesus Christ loved me and he died on the cross for my sins 2,000 years ago and he was my Messiah. And I accepted him as my personal savior. He came into my life. I have faith in him. He changed me, forgave my sins, and gave me the, the power of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. And got me out of drugs, out of Hollywood, out of all those things. And I'm a miracle, or he's a miracle, what he's done in my life. And that's why I'm here today. For the last 20 years, I've been studying prophecy. I'm really interested in this whole subject, and the more I've been studying prophecy, eventually I got to the book of Revelation, and I discovered, lo and behold, the book of Revelation talks about Israel. It talks about Babylon. It talks about a final battle called Armageddon. Now, by this time, I was no longer an, Israel, uh, an Israelite of the flesh, but what was I? I was now part of the Israel of God, part of the Israel of God through Jesus Christ. And now, through the Spirit, I was beginning to perceive spiritual things. And as I studied about Israel and Babylon and the Battle of Armageddon, I came to the conclusion, as I've been studying my Bible, that it is true, yes, it is true, that Israel is at the center of end-time events. That's what the book of Revelation says, folks. 
Israel is the center of the storm at the end of time. And I've come to believe that very, very strongly. But here's the big question. This is the question of all questions. This question is the multi-billion dollar question, and if you get this, if you answer this question right, it's worth more than winning the Texas lottery. I tell you. Israel is the center of the end, but folks, here's the big question. Are you, are you ready for it? The question is, which Israel is the center of the end? Is it the Israel of the flesh, the natural descendants of Abraham? Or is it the Israel of God that is centered in Jesus Christ, composed of Jews and Gentiles who have the Holy Spirit and who believe in the Lord? Which Israel is the center? Stay tuned. We've got a lot more to do. I hope you'll stick with me. As Paul Harvey said, I'll tell you the rest of the story as we get into the book of Revelation and as we continue this hot and controversial subject of Israel in Bible prophecy and through spiritual discernment, we will learn truth from the Bible that will bring us closer and closer to Jesus Christ and will prepare us, will prepare you and me for the end of the world.